All right, well, thank you. Um, my name is Mark Lancaster, director of the Five County Salmonid Conservation Program. And I just want to let you know before we go through the presentation, it's much better if you want to toggle into the full screen mode. You'll see some of the diagrams and drawings and uh, pictures a little clearer in the full screen mode um, versus the uh, smaller screen with the, with the text dialog on the side. So uh, basically, I'm going to give you a quick background. The Five County Salmonid Conservation Program was formed in 1997 in response to the listing of the uh, coho salmon and other anadromous salmonids as uh, threatened species under the, both the federal and the state endangered species acts. And the counties of Northwest California, consisting of Humboldt, Mendocino, Del Norte, Trinity, and Siskiyou, wanted to put together a credible conservation effort. And so they created a program that addresses water quality, fisheries, and in-stream habitat functions within, their, within the county government areas, including road systems. So among the things that uh, the five counties does is create a set of tools that uh, help guide counties in their work. They consist of manuals on routine maintenance practices, barrier inventories for fish passage at, at road stream crossings, road design standards, training and education components, and road uh, sediment source inventories. All of these tools that you see are available at our website, which is www.fivecounties.org. And uh, today, I'm mostly going to be focusing on the roads manual and the best management practices within um, that manual. One of the reasons that uh, a manual and all of these other tools were developed was the among the first tasks that the five counties did was retain the University of California Cooperative Education and Dr. Harris to look at county road practices and other practices and how they affect fisheries, water quality, and salmonid habitat. Um, among the findings of that assessment, which was completed at the end of 1998, were that county road crews were doing things which were sometimes very beneficial towards fisheries and water quality, and sometimes they were not. And it uh, was very chaotic and sporadic. It, you could have one district of a road department which was implementing both positive practices and adverse practices. There was no consistency across the board in what people were doing in their road maintenance. So the recommendation was to create a road maintenance manual to help guide counties to create education and training components to help them understand what they're doing and um, to uh, have opportunities to modify and improve their practices. So to do that, they created a series of best management practices for routine road maintenance. And best management practices are tools that, when implemented, have a predictable outcome. They often have extra built-in protection measures into them so that they're readily repeatable and um, you end up with no surprises. So for instance, if you're going to be doing fire burning, there are over 57 best management practices that are implemented before the, the flames ever hit the ground. Those practices include everything from safety clothing to weather conditions to assessment of fire risk, adequate staffing, even down to uh, the type of fuel used, the mix of the fuels used to create the desired outcome. It's through the use of best management practices that you can develop consistency and the ability to apply uh, the knowledge that has been gained through a lot of people through a lot of years to make sure that you are achieving your objectives. So best management practice is uh, a practice that has, uh, they're generally a vague term, but they describe a method to complete the job. And a lot of times, BMPs can even be behavioral practices. For instance, in our road manual, there is a practice to uh, a best management practice to walk around a vehicle and look for leaks of hydraulic fluid, fuels, oils, and other things that can contaminate a creek. So each time that a, a uh, road crew is going out to work anywhere where discharge can reach a stream, they should be looking at and performing routine maintenance on their vehicles to minimize and prevent excess leaks of oil or other materials. 
The, uh, among the best management practices that we emphasize, and probably one that has the most significant beneficial effect on fisheries, is the timing of water withdrawal and water management for road practices. For instance, this photo that you see in this slide was the result of a series of cumulative effects of water withdrawal. In this particular, this was a 1987 fish kill in, in a stream in Northwest California where a water truck was withdrawing water from a, a pool in a creek at the same time as downstream landowners were turning on pumps. And it was a very, very hot day, middle of the day. The net result of that practice was a significant fish kill. We now have BMPs that very uh, specifically address the There are a number of manuals out there relative to providing best management practice guidance. These two uh, represent uh, the manuals of the counties in Northern California the one on the left is from the Fishnet 4C counties, which is from Mendocino County down to Monterey County. The one on the right is the uh, 5C manual, which represents from the Oregon border down to and including parts of Mendocino County. And they're very similar in their approach. They, um, they both prescribe a series of BMPs and, and training focuses. The uh, Fishnet manual tends to focus more specifically on activities very near to a stream, whereas the 5C is a little broader and focuses also on upslope areas. Um, there's another number of other manuals out there. For instance, there's the Caltrans Stormwater Manual. There's the Oregon Department of Transportation ma uh, Highways Manual. And there's one that came out last year that I like. It's the US Forest Service's environmentally sensitive road maintenance practices for dirt and gravel roads. This is a good one for people who are um, less familiar with the, a lot of the nature of the problems on roads. It uses a series of photos that show the type of problem and based on that photo characterizes what causes the problem and then also recommends some treatments. This is a, a handy little pocketbook that you can get from the Forest Service. It is uh, known as 7700 Management Transportation 1177, and it was released in April of 2012. If you are interested in learning more about that manual and you can't find it yourself, feel free to contact us at www.5counties.org, and we will try to link you up to that manual. The Five Counties Roads manual is broken down into four broad categories. There's a background providing information about why we're here, what, what, uh, why counties need to be involved in, in the awareness of water and fisheries and water quality. Then there's this, uh, the bulk of the manual, which focuses on implementation practices and best management practices to offset impacts. And there's an adaptive management component, which allows us to learn as we go and modify the manual and, and improve our training and feedback mechanisms so that we know we're targeting the, the type of problems and concerns and the issues that road crews are seeing and trying to come up with ways to create general treatment responses to the kind of problems they have. And then there's a, a series of, of toolboxes available. The fishnet, again, is, is very similar to the 5C manual um, with a focus on some very near stream activities and a little greater depth and detail. So looking at the 5C counties, um, we conducted a sediment source inventory throughout uh, about 2,600 miles of the county roads. And what we uh, are looking at are both episodic large-scale failures that could occur on county roads, and these are typically at stream crossings or landslide sites. But we also focus on the more chronic or annual sources of sediment that reach a creek from county roads. And these are highlighted in the yellow in this slide. You can see that they're um, mostly the ones that can be readily addressed by routine road maintenance activities. 
And if you look at the graphs, you can see that um, about 81% of the total potential volume of dirt that would reach a creek from a county road site um, is coming from the actual of the total sediment comes from these sort of chronic routine ditches, road surfaces, the uh, edge of the road. And then you can see that there there is uh, a number of them, about half, which have a, a priority to want to treat as quickly as you can, given all of the factors that drive that. So what are the factors that drive treatment? Um, one of the things that counties have to respond to are citizen complaints and, and complaints or comments and direction from boards, both their board of supervisors as well as the Water Quality Control Board and others. So this is a, uh, it is a component of planning that you have to deal with when you're a county, um, and it's, it's, it's just a very real resource drain, potentially, depending on the nature of the, of the concern, whether it's, it's the highest priority or it's just the most visible. But then looking at other more proactive ways of addressing um, routine road maintenance, one of the things that we focus on is training the county road crews in new practices or uh, emphasizing practices that are beneficial and recognizing sites and knowing when to modify a practice. So one of the things about our counties is that they are committed to an aggressive training program, which includes two trainings a year for water quality fisheries components. The things that we emphasize are early inspection, annual inspection, early enough to program work and to um, make sure you can get things done during your work periods. And with that annual inspection, you're able to schedule your maintenance based on a variety of factors that include protection of the environment. And this is something that is relatively new to, to road departments only in the last 15 to 20 years, has protection of water quality, threatened and endangered species, limited operating periods, timing operations to match the lowest periods or, or dry periods of streams when you're working in, in waterways. But other factors that are equally as important and have to be considered are staffing schedules, the availability of crews to perform maintenance activities, the available of equipment and materials that you need to actually successfully complete maintenance activities, the accessibility of sites to get into them, um, and then to awareness to know that when you are chronically returning to the same site and having to, to perform maintenance, that maybe you need to step back and look at the nature of the site and see if it is uh, necessary to upgrade that site to solve your, your, your maintenance problem. So within our roads manual, Chapter 11 is our best management planning training program. Like I said, every year the counties uh, have at least two trainings devoted to awareness and implementation of, of best management practices in relationship to fisheries and water quality. These trainings, one includes a multiple day training that is both classroom and field application on site projects, and the other one is a one day refresher course in a, some aspect of the roads maintenance manual. So the purpose of the road trainings are to reach all levels of road crews, from crew workers, supervisors, engineers, and management, because the actual practice of road maintenance activities has to be from the top down. There, there is a, if the leadership does not recognize the need to address these things, it's, it's almost impossible to see it translated on the ground. So some of the trainings that we have put on over the years include the implementation, watersheds, best management practices through the chapters, fish passage, water drafting, maintenance, vegetation, bridges, and monitoring reporting. These are topics that we will cover during our training periods. So one of the things that we emphasize as a high priority is the identification of uh, culverts and an annual and culvert inspection. With over 16,000 culverts in the five counties area on county roads, it's 
almost impossible to inventory all of them every year. But as you can see, there's a, uh, there are often problems that can go undetected for a period of time that can become critical and, and cause significant uh, damage. So for instance, this uh, photo down in the lower right hand clearly shows a, a culvert which is disconnected in both uh, top and bottom segments, has water diverting under the pipe, and is one that needs immediate attention. The, uh, the focus is on getting in, getting those inspections, and then being able to prioritize the treatments that need to be done. One of the areas that is so critical in your culvert inspection is looking for blockages. Um, there's a, a lot of misconception among people who don't work with crossings that large wood or large boulders or other things are what plug culverts. In fact, there's actually been a number of, of studies and efforts that have shown that your culvert pluggings often occur from small materials that begin to build up in the front of the culvert and then they gradually collect more and more material until your crossing has uh, plugged and you have the potential for it to fail and divert or scour out a stream channel. So one of the areas of uh, BMPs for counties is to annually get out and inspect these culverts. Another reason is that sometimes conditions may change before you're aware of it and create risks. This particular culvert crossing is located in decomposed granite soils, which are highly erodible. They're also a particle size, or mostly a sand size, that is uh, very, uh, packs very densely in stream bottoms, so it tends to smother fish uh, eggs when it comes down in the winter, covers up uh, salmon nests and will actually cause the bottom of a, of a stream to become almost embedded. So the risk here is that a, a recent timber harvest has accumulated large piles of, of woody material on both sides of the culvert such that it could plug and jam and then could cause the road to, the culvert to plug and then the road to fail. Sometimes you just have to be surprised at what you find when you're out there in the, in the road doing routine road maintenance. This is an example of a, a routine maintenance effort where the uh, road crew found somebody's pot stash within their, uh, within their ditch line. So we know they were out looking. In addition, in, in Northwest California, there are a number of counties that do not have grading ordinances, and, and sometimes you will see new road construction on private properties that can substantially alter your drainage as a, as a county. ...cause it into an, an existing road will alter the natural drainage patterns that have uh, developed on that road system. So for instance, you're now collecting more water in the same size storm, which means that you, the ditch that used to carry X amount of water now must carry Y, and to do that, it will invariably increase in size and width to accommodate that increased flow. So as, as uh, best management practices, you need to be aware of what's going on into your road system so that you can be proactive in dealing with it. You can resize your system if you need to. You can work with those landowners or if necessary, you can take actions to prevent increased runoff and sediment down the line. So like I said, implementing maintenance consists of a lot of factors that are go into play and affect when and how often you can get into and work on a road. Some of the, the newer factors that we're seeing considered by counties are the protection of the environment, as well as some of the other more traditional factors that have to be considered staffing schedules, equipment, availability of materials, accessibility, and knowing when you need to move from maintenance to an actual project to upgrade a, uh, a road feature. So chapter three of our manual deals with road maintenance. And um, we're going to look really quickly at ditch shaping and ditch cleaning. You can see to the left, this is a, 
uh, portion of the description of ditch shaping and cleaning best management practice needs and the BMPs. And on the right, you can see a, a, a road during a large storm in which the ditch has plugged, the water has diverted out of the ditch, has run down the outside of the road, and is discharging um, over the bank and into the creek. So the best management practices look at ways to prevent that kind of problem and, and to solve it where it occurs. One of the questions is, what is a ditch? In theory, a ditch is, is, has two components. It has the physical ditch itself and an endpoint. In actuality, they can actually become streams. Many ditches intercept small creeks, carry them uh, down long lengths of road and deposit them in the stream channels where they did not exist before. And when that happens, those ditches can actually become streams themselves. They can develop biological features such as wetland and riparian areas. They can actually support aquatic species, frogs, um, salamanders, even fish. And once your road ditch has become a creek, your ability to operate on it and maintain it becomes substantially more difficult. So the road BMPs cover uh, important tools to prevent that from happening. One of the most important is avoiding diverting streams down into ditches. So for instance, on the left in this photo, you can see there is a ditch running down the road, but there's actually a class three photo in the middle of the, of the site that runs down, hits the ditch, is diverted down the road, and continues on to the next creek. As part of the implementation project for this road, the culvert was installed at the, the class three stream so that the stream now is restored to its natural drainage. The road has been outsloped, the ditch has been filled entirely, and the water now runs across the road rather than down and into a ditch so that it restores the natural hydrologic function of that particular hill slope. This is a common BMP. When installing ditch relief culverts to dewater your, your, your culvert, to dewater your ditches and to maintain and restore natural hydrologic conditions, you have to know the proper way to do it. And so our road manual and our trainings focus on the right way to do it. In this particular picture, the culvert is being installed at a 90 degree angle to the ditch, which means that uh, a lot of the energy will be dissipated as the water makes that turn at 90 degrees. A lot of sediment can drop out at the inlet, and you can um, actually have a potential for ditch plugging. A uh, possibly better treatment is to set that pipe both at a, at a deep slope angle in the crossing and at about a 45 degree angle to the ditch so that the, the water can make a uh, more direct entry into the pipe, less potential for sediment building up on the inlet side, less potential for diversion. And again, these are the type of things that we focus on. One of the biggest areas of chronic sediment erosion is the ditch itself. And you have a number of ditch sources of sediment. So one is slumping, where the, the hillside is actually just simply caving in and, and blocks of dirt are falling down into the ditch, which can then cause the ditch to plug and divert. Another is rill and gully erosion, where uh, water rivulets from above concentrate into the slope and carry it down. And another is a simple raindrop impact where devegetated slopes become subject to the effects of raindrop erosion. Ditch cleaning is a practice that is done to maintain ditches, to prevent them from jumping out of their channel, running across a road, tearing up the roadbed, and potentially going over the bank and causing significant problems. But ditch cleaning in itself can be a significant source of sediment. The constant removal of the vegetation at the toe of a slope can increase the slope angle, which can cause slumping and rilling. Uh, on the on the bank, which can ex greatly accelerate your your failures into your ditch, which then greatly increases your need to pull the ditch, um, and the loss lock, lack of vegetation also allows that sediment to.
one of the areas that we focus on in ditch cleaning is to retain as much vegetation as possible and to only uh, pull the portions of the ditches that really need to be pulled. In the past, one of the uh, typical encouragements of road crew foremen was for the foreman to be able to see where the grader operator had clearly pulled and cleaned that ditch. So if a grader operator, if a foreman was driving down the road and he could see a very clear, crisp, clean, bright line where the, the blade had been, that told him that that operator was doing a lot of, of good work. If he came by and he saw very little uh, pulling, he might not think they're working so hard. In fact, they're actually having to be more careful and, and move slower and do more work by focusing on a pulling only the portions of the ditch that need to be pulled to maintain the flow within the ditch and preserving the rest of it so that it is um, continuing to provide drainage but not providing erosion. Ditch management can become tricky. If you let water stand for long periods of time within your ditch, it can form into wetlands and provide other critical habitats for certain species, such as, again, frogs, salamanders, um, and other species that then, to protect those species um, during the reproductive cycles and, and uh, germination and, and the new populations, you may end up limiting the time of operations that you can work in your ditch systems. And if you have a lot of ditches with a lot of limited time periods that you can actually get into them, being able to maintain your system may not be, uh, may become very problematic for you. Again, ditch cleaning is a critical issue. As you can see in the upper right-hand photo, you can see that a greater operator has come across and done a, a, a fairly aggressive blading. You can see the, the discharge of the sediment going into the culvert inlet, and you can see that, that that is not a natural angle of repose for that slope. So you're going to actually trigger more material slumping and creeping into the ditch, which is going to trigger additional pulling. Timing of operations is also a, a significant consideration. If you're pulling ditches when it's wet and rainy, you have a far greater chance of, making, of getting that sediment delivered to a stream system rather than in the dry period of the year. This is a, a particularly problematic ditch impact. In this particular case, the county pulled the ditch uh, material out onto the road surface. They then collected that road, mat that, that ditch material into uh, loaders, loaded them into dump trucks, hauled away the material to an approved spoils disposal site, and then they came back in with a water truck to wash the dirt off the road surface. They sprayed the water. That water with uh, the sediment in it was carried back into the ditch, the, the now freshly pulled ditch, and all of that water then went down and discharged into a fish-bearing stream. This, that in itself is a problem. What makes this one particularly bad is that the ditch was pulled in the middle of summer, as in, in July. The outside air temperatures were in the high 90s. And so the addition of that dark sediment on a very hot day in the middle of summer in a stream um, it is particularly hard on the aquatic resources in the stream. Temperatures can go up in the stream, dissolved oxygen can go down, and there's a number of problems. So once we became aware of this particular type of practice, we got together with the counties. We do routinely show this slide and talk about this as a, uh, a practice to avoid and to not use going forward. One solution to this is to actually use vacuum sweep trucks that can come along and sweep and clean a road surface rather than using water trucks. Other alternatives include um, placing filters at the inlet or the outlet of culverts so that if you do pull your ditch or you have uh, wet discharges, you can contain them um, through those filters before they ever reach a stream. Again, just examples of vegetation maintenance. In this particular case, you can see that the ditch is well mowed and taken care of. Um, and then uh, in a spot where the grading got a little aggressive, you, have, you can see that there's quite a bit of difference in the amount of potential sediment 
coming off of the site. Now, in this particular case, the county came back and mulched and put filters uh, in the area where they had uh, been a little aggressive or very aggressive on pulling the ditch. There are a number of innovative techniques that people try to protect water quality when they're working in ditch management. Um, in this particular case, the photo in the upper left shows a slumping hill slope. In fact, this is actually a regional geologic thrust fault line where the bedrock and the soil have been sheared and compressed and chopped up so that it's very weak and subject to uh, slumping and sliding. To address that, the county installed a ditch relief culvert that took the water from the upslope side of the road carried it across the unstable area on a side slope uh, plastic pipe, as you can see in the lower left-hand photo, and then discharged it into a stable area, as you can see in the lower right-hand photo. The center photo just shows a technique used to, um, to strengthen and, and hopefully maintain downspouts on, on culverts. And the upper right-hand photo is a during construction effort to reduce the potential of erosion from the end of a pipe um, by creating this uh, arched downspout that discharges onto bedrock. Um, that project is relatively new, and we're still seeing if that one is going to work well. Another area of routine road maintenance, and, and or in this case, this would represent a site where routine maintenance is not effective and you need to look at doing a project to address the underlying problem. This is a through cut area of a road where the uh, uphill bank side and the downhill uh, discharge side are actually higher than the road surface. Water tends to pond in these areas. Because they're higher on both sides, the roads do not drain well. They tend to get saturated. And you can see the cross section in this particular case showing a number of severe ruts. You can see that the, uh, the original road conditions showed very large ruts in the road, as well as a berm on the outside edge. The treatment was to reshape the road to eliminate the ruts to eliminate the inside ditch, to outslope the road, and because of the nature of these soils being very plastic, very malleable, um, geofabric tech was laid down underneath the rock surface once the road was outsloped and the ditch removed and the berms removed. Um, there was an additional benefit in the use of geofabric in this particular site because it was such a long distance from a rock source that the geofabric allowed you to lay down less rock than you would have had to have put down um, if you were not relying on the geofabric. And the geofabric is relatively inexpensive relative to the cost of the rock. Again, another practice that counties are using is to change the, the drainage shape and the drainage function of the roads. So on the left, you have the traditional road design. You've got an inboard ditch and a big berm. On the outside, all water is concentrated into the ditch, carried down to a stream where it's discharged. The post-treatment consisted of filling the ditch, outsloping the road entirely. Um, and one of the advantages to this type of treatment is that reduced maintenance staffing levels and reduced funding for maintenance have meant that counties can't get out and treat sites nearly as often as they used to. A road that is in an outslope condition uh, we have found has required far less maintenance on some of them going as much as a decade before they uh, have a blade put on them or they need supplemental rock. Now, most of the outsloping treatments proposed on county roads tend to be on low volume, uh, remote road systems with very low traffic and tend not to be in areas that are subject to significant snow and ice accumulations. We have a road design standard called the Low Impact to Hydrology Road Design that specifies when and where uh, outsloping and rolling dip techniques can be used on county roads. Most of county road maintenance on rural roads, on unsurfaced or unpaved roads, excuse me, um, 
consist of reblading the existing rock. But as we strive to improve water quality and, and habitat conditions, you will see more and more efforts to try to surface roads to prevent rill and gully erosion. And there are BMPs that address all aspects of these maintenance activities. So for instance, there are BMPs that talk about the practices of graders when they pull the outside edge of a road, the temporary storage of the materials pulled, how those berms are handled. There's BMPs that address where the water comes from what for the water truck and its application. There are BMPs regarding the maintenance of the equipment and looking for leaks, even uh, BMPs addressing the storage of the equipment. So every aspect of road maintenance is looked at as closely as possible, trying to find ways to both economically and realistically protect the environment. One area that is a, a emerging within our manual is a BMP to recycle as much of materials used by counties as possible, and, and an area of that is asphalt grindings. Both state highways and county roads generate a fair amount of asphalt grindings. They are uh, able to be used as a rock surface, uh, excuse me, as a road surfacing, and um, it is being used in all of the counties, everywhere from the uh, east side uh, in Siskiyou County to the coastal ranges in Humboldt County. The uh, practices are still in refinement, but for instance, we tend to pull the asphalt grindings away from stream areas and use them in other areas. Once the, the, the grindings themselves are considered inert because they, uh, any oils in them have long been dried before they were ground up. But um, as a precaution, we tend to try to avoid using them in stream crossings. They are a cost-effective way to surface a road, though. BMPs address all aspects of the work. As I said earlier, everything from concrete washout areas to water storage, um, all of these aspects are covered within the manual. An area that is important in, in all of the road treatments are the follow-up after you've disturbed the ground, the series of erosion control treatments that can be done. So in um, all of our projects, there is a call for mulching and seeding and to control weeds within treated sites. You can see there's a variety of techniques that are used to address that. One area that we're experimenting with and um, encouraging more people to look at this is the use of non-straw mulches. So um, I'm not a big fan of straw mulch in a uh, roadside environment, so here are some ground up by utility companies and then spread. In the upper right is a native pine needle mulch that was collected from the site and then redistributed onto a, a road that was decommissioned. And then down below is again a native mulch site in lieu of straw mulches. And uh, I encourage people to look at the use of those options. So stream crossings are uh, the most significant potential sediment sources and thus they tend to be among the more expensive and problematic aspects of road maintenance. We have BMPs that call for the upgrading of culverts to convey the 100-year storm flow, as well as bed load and debris if it's a fish passage crossing. The current designs or, or designs prior to the adoption of the road maintenance manuals were to design crossings with a 10-year culvert size. And as I said, they're now upsized to the 100-year culvert size. We emphasize the proper placement and alignment of culverts. In the old days, pipe was relatively expensive and labor was relatively inexpensive. So there were practices to put in pipes that were as short as possible, which tended to put them in at 90 degrees to the road crossing. They tended to be buried relatively shallow and they tended to often not align with the channel. So as we upgrade county roads, we place an emphasis on the proper alignment 
of the pipe into the channel, the proper grade of the pipe to match the natural stream channel, as well as uh, the placement of energy dissipation at those. And I should emphasize these are, um, this is a class three stream, which is considered an ephemeral stream. It only flows in response to winter storms. So for instance, the type of mulching used at the inlet as shown in the lower left photo is a, a very effective way to prevent erosion, but would not be suitable for a stream that had riparian vegetation growth. Again, uh, examples of correcting past problems. The photo on the left shows an 18 inch diameter culvert located at a flat angle, um, approximately 60 feet above the bottom of the fill slope. That pipe was removed. A 70 foot long pipe was installed 24 inch diameter and the entire site was uh, rock armored because of the potential for diversion of the stream crossing due to particular aspects of that, that particular site. The road manual includes best management practices and techniques for reducing set, uh, erosion and sediment from these crossings as treatments are done. This is an example of one of those. Again, examples of using rock armoring at uh, ephemeral streams. There is a uh, significant portion of the manual that deals with the spoils that are generated as a result of routine road maintenance or emergency operations. There's also an emphasis on re recovering and reusing materials. And as the cost of rock has gone up, the benefits of recycling and, re and recovering materials has also increased. So for instance, Trinity County ha collects all of their slide debris, takes it down to a processing yard where they sort it over time and turn it into usable products. Everything from mulches to large rock to small rock to, to road grade surface rock material. Um, they're constantly taking what was in the past a disposal problem and, and recycling it into a beneficial resource. And other counties are doing the same. Slides, spoils, and revegetation are components that are being routinely developed within the counties, techniques to reduce the overall erosion, techniques to reduce their maintenance costs as well. So spoils management, there are, there are three types of spoils management within the roads manual. There are permanent, temporary, and emergency locations. And each one has different criteria for siting. So for instance, permanent sites are located where the material can be revegetated. It will not erode or degrade and result in discharge into stream systems. Permanent sites are located in areas that are compatible with other land uses. Things like habitat considerations are built into it. Temporary locations uh, have similar constraints, but the intent is to keep that material on site for less than a year to move it to a permanent site and then to revegetate it. Emergency locations often are on the edge of the road, somewhere away from a creek. And, and sometimes when you have a slide or a large flood, the material is so wet and gooey that to try to pick it up and haul it away actually ends up becoming a bigger problem than to simply push it out of the way, let water drain off of it, and then mobilize it to a temporary and or a permanent site. Um, as you deal with the emergency that you're working on. The maintenance manual addresses road, uh, excuse me, addresses bridge maintenance. Principally, it deals with um, the activities around cleaning the bridge and removing drift material. Examples of, of drift removal and some of the innovation that are being done by counties is this site where a cottonwood tree was floating downstream uh, towards a bridge. The county road crew removed the, the cottonwood tree from the upstream side of the bridge, placed it on an eroding bank on the downstream side of the bridge, and you can see vegetation and embedding it in the edge of the bank. So these are the types of innovations that are encouraged when they're done, um, they're brought back and demonstrated to other counties and others as ways to manage their, their 
roads and facilities. Chapter nine of our manual it deals with the management of snow. This is principally limited to the higher elevation counties such as Trinity and Siskiyou County. And um, I encourage you to go online and take a look at that if you want. It lays out the, uh, the practices to consider when working in snow, ways again, these are all focused on protecting water quality. So there are vegetation management BMPs adjacent to streams and water courses and wetlands. And the emphasis here is on retaining functional habitats while also meeting the safety requirements of the county road. And again, it's a, a awareness and training techniques, things for the county crews to look at and consider while they're doing the work. These are examples of vegetation management and outsloping done concurrently. You can see the, the, the ditch vegetation and the slope vegetation, and then as the road is outsloped and, and the effects of that. The counties experiment with new options, ways to better protect the environment and still meet their, their road needs. So for instance, we have looked at use of bioengineering techniques on bank stabilizations. Again, the use of bioengineering in various locations continue to be emphasized and the counties continue to work towards implementing more of these 